Welcome to my review of the June 26th edition of AEW Dynamite. That was the go-home show for Forbidden Door. And yeah, AEW is continuing with this streak of very balanced shows when it comes to storytelling and wrestling. They might not do the same type of storytelling the WWE does, but they do more grounded, actually, more realistic style as they've done throughout their whole history. No supernatural stuff, no insanely, absurdly comedic stuff as well. Just wrestling programs. But I don't know if that's enough yet to get back the audience that you've lost. But things are looking up, thankfully. Ratings have rebounded. And if they just don't F it up, if they just maintain this after Forbidden Door, things are going to be okay. It's all in season after. But yeah, let's begin with the show. So for the first segment of the show, we have MJF opening or seemingly opening with a promo. So yeah, he comes in ready to give his the usual promo segment. This usually opens Dynamites. It's towards the city, insults them, whatever. Gains their praise, leaves. But here we get a twist. Daniel Garcia comes in. And I can't believe it. MJF just lets him talk. He kind of sinks down a bit. He just lets Daniel Garcia talk. I mean, Daniel said positive things in his one speed of talking compared to MJF's Infinity. But like the old MJF would run him down. Like MJF doesn't have to run Daniel down. But maybe if he just shut up at the start, looked at him like, if you say one thing wrong, I'm going to kill you. Compared to saying what he said. Like in this part right here in the picture. It's like him nervously telling Danny to watch it. And I've heard podcasters say that they want another like heel run from MJF, but I think it's too soon. And I think whatever he says, if he ever goes back to his old MJF self, I don't think that'll work anymore. It's not going to turn him heel. He's, he's too endeared to the crowd. And I like my character development, and it's just not believable if MJF kind of regresses. Like, he's a more mature character now. He was a kid back then, so I'd rather not... Have him go back to the way he was with the cheating in every match, losing every pay-per-view feud version of himself. If MJF does become a heel again, I would like less of a bad guy who tears you down with his mic skills, but makes great points. And I would rather have him be legit like evil. Like the cheap heat MJF is done and played out. And I'm much more fine with this babyface version of MJF that's a lot less animated compared to when he was with Adam Cole. Like in here, he's the adult. So yeah, in this promo, Danny puts MJF over. He thanks MJF for a shot that was given to him on the November 9th edition of Dynamite. They seem to be friends, but MJF pulls it back in an almost sort of motivational way that he's beaten Danny very easily. So I guess to sum things up, MJF's gimmick now is an AW homer, babyface, franchise player, I guess. That's what you call it. So yeah, he challenges Daniel Garcia to a match at All in Wembley, which they both like. For me, it's not who MJF should face. He should be going for the world title, honestly. I don't know if he has to win it yet, but they make it a big deal. But then, true heel fashion, proving Swerve Strickland right in every way, in everything that he said. Will Ospreay, our friendly neighborhood bruv, like an asshole, steals the spotlight from both MJF and Danny. And oh yeah, I called MJF an AEW homer because he only respects the originals. That's why he's friends with Danny. But then the epitome of what he hates, someone who came from another place, from New Japan, comes in and steals the spotlight. It's pretty much one of the things that MJF hates the most. He's had feuds with all of them from CM Punk, Adam Cole, Kenny Omega, Brian Danielson, Samoa Joe, basically everyone that he's faced. Osprey gives Daniel a shot next week, completely stealing the spotlight from both men. He's stretching himself out too thin. But what I don't understand is that MJF just takes it. He just yields and leaves. Will's hubris will lead to his downfall, but after talking a big game about Will, I think MJF should have torched him here. This would have been the perfect opportunity to set something up at the pay-per-view. 
at All In with MJF and Will or with MJF and Swerve. We could have had Swerve come out here. This segment could have been so much better, but it was already good as it is. And bro, Will even promises a world title match, even though he hasn't won it yet. And my god, Will is so gonna lose. Clean in the middle of the ring. He has to. And then after this, we get Swerve's response, and then he just says what I said. And he's right. He's already won the feud. It's a foregone conclusion. Will Ospreay's gonna lose. Because he has to. Great segment, could have been better, but it was running a bit long, I guess. So after this, we have BCC versus LIJ, and I hate... Hate, hate, hate the silence that LIJ got and actually all of the New Japan stars that we've had in this show. Like, come on, man. It wasn't that long when New Japan was so hot that you wanted all of them in your promotion. And bro, if nothing else, they look cooler than the CMLL guys. But as for this match, this was just like an exhibition. This was basically a New Japan six-man more than an AEW six-man. It was just a vehicle to showcase Shingo, and I guess Titan as well. Hiromu didn't do much. And I don't even like the structure of the match. Like, I don't like who dominated. Like, since, you know what, since Shingo's gonna lose anyway, why not have him dominate large portions of the match? Like, have him just beat on Wheeler Yura. Even that's enough. But instead, we had it the other way where the whole BCC dominate Titan for majority of the match. But yeah, Titan was showcased, and he was really good, but I just wanted Hiromu to get shine in America, but yeah. As for Shingo, he could have looked better, but he had the hot tag, and I guess they made him look good enough to be a threat against Danielson. But man, he could have won the match. Like, who gives a shit if Wheeler Yuta gets pinned by Shingo Takagi? Like, that should be the natural order of things, and they didn't have to go for this ending right here. And yeah, why the hell would Mox bring a chair randomly to hit Hiromu with it and not even attempt to win the match? Like, that, this was the stupidest ending ever. Like, could you have just given New Japan one win on AWTV to pin just the weakest member of a faction? Like, this would have built up Shingo better if he won the match, if he just pinned Wheeler. Nothing really incredible happened. I don't think I have a top three spots of the match. Everyone pretty much, except Shingo and Titan, phoned it in. Post-match is when Naito shows up. And then he has like a simple brawl against Mox outside the arena. You know what? If the reaction was much better, if they were in the West Coast, I would have wanted this in the ring prolonged. Since Naito's probably gonna beat Mox at the pay-per-view. But with this crowd right here, I'm okay with what happened. We also get a Danielson versus Shingo face-to-face -face in the ring that I think did the job. The crowd got loud and, I guess, hyped up the match to like a 6 out of 10 grade. Shingo could have just won the match, man. And that would have been a pass. But nah, this match was bad. It's TV undercard only. You know what? It's a New Japan Road 2 show only. It's what I tried to avoid, man. Come on. So after this, thankfully, is a better match. It's actually really good. It's Jay White versus Ray Phoenix in the quarterfinals of the Owen tournament. It feels good to see the Bang Bang Gang slash Bullet Club Gold again at full force with Juice Robinson. This pairing made sense because Death Triangle are still feuding with the BBG and DT are probably going to win those titles at Wembley. I think Juice should have a couple of wins with that title before they eventually lose it because it's going to be when Juice is in charge of the trios. Colton or Austin's going to take the pin, but Juice is going to be the leader of that trio. But I think they've done enough with this. I think they've had a good run. Let someone have their chance. But man, did they waste so much time here. BBG couldn't just leave the ringside area right away. They could have just left, but they ended up shaving like about two minutes in a card where you overran at the end. It's the match that we expect. It has a standard structure where Phoenix does the high spots, he speeds things up. It's an even start, but then Jay White dominates the middle. He's a less boring Randy Orton. 
with that reactive counter base style of his. The match, unlike many that we've had in this pay-per-view cycle, reaches a climax. Like, man, I didn't expect a Jay White versus Ray Fenix match to be better than a Claudio versus Pac match. But this was. But we clearly saw in the climax, even though Ray managed to even things up again, that Jay White's tactics, the grounding tactics, worked. Like, Fenix was pinned down by the end. And when he tried to dive Blade Runner as much of out of nowhere as you can get for the Jay White win. Top three spots of the match, number three, is the pull-off apron spot where as Fenix is about to jump off the apron, Jay pulls him, Fenix lands a bit weird, but the fall looked really good by Fenix. Number two is when Jay heads up to a young fan who's telling him that he sucks and then asks him, is that your mother? Because she's the only one who sucks around here. And the best spot is the finish, counter to the Blade Runner for the win. It's not the epic that we wanted, but it had a climax. The ending doesn't come out of nowhere. It's not dumb. And the right person won, setting up a match at Wembley Stadium, even if he doesn't end up winning the tournament, because he's not. So yeah, TV main event, pay-per-view undercard. So after this is an odd detour, where I guess we're not gonna have DT against BBG at Wembley, because the patriarchy starts shit. I would appreciate a multi-trios man match. It's going to be a mess, but I, I think you can create another t- match type out of nowhere, I guess, where that can happen. House of Black, BBG, Death Triangle, and the Patriarchy, all in one match. But yeah, it's heel versus heel, but I guess BBG are less heels. They are pretty cool guys, unlike Christian, who's just a downer. So after this, is the Young Bucks addressing some online criticism where they declare the Elite's intentions. They want all the titles with them, so they have leverage, so they can regain control. But honestly, Tony Khan should not have come back. Like, they should have had a prolonged time of, like, just, you know what, just, like, ownership of the company, basically. Just have Tony Khan out. I think he came back too soon, but it's not too late to amend this. Having all of those titles is a pretty good power play, but I don't know if Swerve should lose his right away. And as for the wild card that they declared that they'll be entering themselves, obviously, it's gonna be Hangman Page. But what if it's not, though? That'll be fun. But if it's Hangman, yeah, he kind of has to win. He's lost to Swerve over and over and over again. It would be nice to have Hagman as champion again. It, it'd be nice to have the Elite have all the titles and have Swerve chase. But I don't really think that if Swerve loses that title that he's going to come back and win it until Osprey and MJF have had their runs with it again. But yeah, if Hangman wins it, I think he'll just be like a transitional champion for two pay-per-view cycles. So after this is the acclaimed promo and... Yeah, Max's mustache does not work. I think that's why people are starting to hate him. But yeah, Max takes the back seat here. Bowens was the star of the promo. It was so intense. And I can understand everything he says. Max, on the other hand, looks like he's phoning it in a bit. But this was basically the Acclaim's usual shtick. Starting to get a bit old. They need to find another way to revive this whole gimmick of theirs. Has it been like two years? Yeah, it's it's been two years and they're still like the same. But yeah, thankfully, Okada and the Elite show up. Scissor me, bitch. And then we get the reveal of the match at the pay-per-view. Tanahashi is the guy they add. And I guess the crowd know him. They react well. But as for this match, I like that he sort of calls Okada out, his old rival. And I like that he's in the trios match since it'll hide all of his flaws. Because honestly, Tanahashi should not be wrestling anymore. He'll be the most pinnable person in that match when it happens. The nostalgia will be there. I think there will be flashes of Okada against Tanahashi. But he needs to be the one getting pinned. Or Max Caster. By Okada. But yeah, like, this is pretty cool. They need something to do at Forbidden Door. It's gonna be a fun match in between. So after this is the conglomeration with Mark Briscoe, Kyle O'Reilly, and Orange Cassidy. 
And it looks like Mark Briscoe is going to cut another one of his intense promos and Kyle's just going to react while Orange doesn't. But this time we have a twist. We have them going in a direction that I did not expect. I thought they were just going to like play this out with Mark Briscoe doing the same thing until it gets sold. But we have Kyle O'Reilly doing a Mark Briscoe style promo and he actually does it well. I love Kyle O'Reilly, man. He's like one of the most underrated charisma guys out there. He's already like a funny dude. But when given the opportunity, unlike his early run here in AW, as well as when he was in the Undisputed era, where the focus was more on Adam Cole, he can shine as well. Is he a main eventer? No, but he's a good act in the mid card with a very interesting style. And we'll see his style later in his match against ZSJ in full force. So yeah, after this is Tony Storm, Mina Shirakawa, and Mariah May against the Outcasts. So seeing this announced, you can't help but think that the Outcasts are just the side characters. The main focus of the match is the feud between Mina and Tony. Like even the entrances, man. Like we had Tony Storm and Mariah May go out first, and then Mariah May goes back and does the entrance with Mina. Like, dude, storytelling. Who does this? But yeah, for the match itself, man, Mina Shirakawa isn't even the best stardom wrestler. Tam Nakano, Suzu Suzuki, Mayu Iwatani, and of course, Shuri. Like, Mina, I don't think, is even in the top five. And yet she outshines the outcasts. She had zero, zero divas awkwardness. Actually, Tony, Mariah, and Mina had zero. So yeah, moves were done in the match. The faces were facing off against heels, but they were just tools. The heels were. The point of this was the in-ring storytelling of can they coexist. But we have an added element here of someone they both care about actually being affected. But Mina ends up being the more heelish character. She refuses to tag in, to, to like sub out Tony Storm. And sometimes she just tags Tony Storm to take advantage of the situation. And of course, Mariah has to choose who she tags, leading to her getting her ass beat. The Outcasts have a dominating face with... The Outcasts had a pretty varied offense, but I was not noticing much because I was focused on Mina and Tony. But yeah, basically this was just a story match. Not the usual structure. We had a cool climax with Mina tagging in to take advantage of the situation, spinning back fist. She hits her cool looking finisher for the win, Top spots of the match. Number two is when Mariah had to choose between who to tag. And number one is the finish. Perfect way to get heel heat on Mina and have her get a win before she eventually loses to Tony. Because of course. As for the post-match, I think this is like the true meat of this whole segment is. Because here we see, confirmed, Mina Shirakawa is the heel. Tony's okay to adjust. Mariah was trying to play peacemaker with a champagne, but then... Mina chooses violence, attempts to hit Tony, but hits Mariah instead. This feud has been successfully built. I'm pretty excited. This match is a TV main event, pay-per-view undercard. So after this is the Mercedes and Stephanie Vaquer pre-recorded promo battle. Because we know like Mercedes has a weakness in promos. And by the sounds of it, it looks like in English, at least, Stephanie can't cut. One that is live. It's going to be terrible when they both face off and then have an awkward promo battle. You need to be like MJF level to be able to carry someone with a language barrier. But yeah, this was simple. I want the title. No, I want the title. Let's have the match. I'm going to win. I'm the boss. But the best part of this is having the CMLL footage that the promo is being played to. We get to see when Mercedes was there, what she did, the brawl. But I think we should have had a brawl here. We've barely seen Stephanie on AWTV. And we're going to get it on Collision. Holy shit. But that's for the TBS title. It should have been on Dynamite. And so after this is the best learning tree segment that we've ever gotten. And that bar is very low. We have another routine Jericho trying to recruit Suzuki for a forbidden door again for the third straight year with another one of his factions. If they just simply added Suzuki to the team, I would have been so disappointed, but I like the way they did this. 
So first, Big Bill cuts a pretty good promo. He has the comedic timing. We all know that. But as for the actual segment, Jericho got a video message from Suzuki probably days before that he didn't open because he wanted to show it to the public. That's just a funny situation. And then you have the swerve after being so sure of something. You know what? It, it fits with the sort of dumb character that Jericho has. And I like that they did this. I like that this reduces Jericho to like a joke. Because this gimmick just ain't it. But yeah, I like Big Bill and this whole situation. And I kind of pop for the Samoa joke line. But yeah, we have a challenge by Suzuki thrown out instead of a team up and we even get a high guy. They don't announce that it's gonna happen at Forbidden Door. It's gonna happen at some point on a dynamite. And sadly, Suzuki's probably gonna lose and I think he should. This is maybe the only Learning Tree segment that I've enjoyed. And it's with Jericho not going the full gimmick. And man, after this, this became the best hook segment that I've ever seen. Because he just shut up and let Joe do all the talking. The promo actually had me afraid for their lives. Like you have two killers and a killer junior surrounding you in the ring. Joe takes a pause, builds up the tension of the situation, and then he beats their ass. The learning tree rightfully gets beaten the shit out of. It doesn't quite look like it's on the way out. There might be like a prolonged feud before All In. But yeah, just, just like kill the gimmick right now. Have these three destroy Jericho, cut it short, cut your losses, take a break, Jericho. And finally, we have the second to the last match of the show, the penultimate match. ZSJ versus Kyle O'Reilly. Now this, this is wrestling. Because we have like two of the most realistic looking styles. I mean for Kyle. For Zack, it's quite debatable, but it does look kind of realistic. I think the Malachi match look the most realistic like it basically looked like mma but this one it kind of looked like that but for me to look better i think it needed to look a lot more fake i think zach should have did all of his technical wizard wrestling stuff he should have done all the holds all of the weird pins that he has that we know he has but yeah i did enjoy all of the holds submissions and transitions Zack works on Kyle's left arm with holds and even snapped his fingers more than what Kyle did with just kicking Zack's left leg. It plays to the finish. Kyle is unable to perform his signature move of like a Juji Katami. He's unable to like pull the arm completely because not only does his arm but his fingers also hurt. And then we have Zack zero in on this arm, hit the Fujiwara arm bar at the end and then win the match. Top spots of the match, I have a lot actually. But I'm just going to narrow it down to three. Number three is the finger snapping spot. Number two is this double leg takedown. Number one is the finish. Where Zach gets him in a Fujiwara armbar for the win. Really good match right here. I think I'm going to give it TV main event. Pay-per-view undercard. For the post-match... We have just an orgy of people in the ring. We had... Who was this again? Like TMDK show up. We had the Undisputed Kingdom and Bullet Club Alliance show up. And then we have Chaos with Just Ishii backing Orange Cassidy up. They all face off, but we didn't really need all of this. A brawl I think would have been better. So after this is another Can They Coexist match. Swerve Strickland, Will Ospreay versus Gates of Agony. Again, the focus is on one side, but they let the Gates of Agony shine a bit. Just a bit, though. Because with this combination, with these opponents that you have opposite you, how can you not succeed as Gates of Agony? If they don't look good here, they won't look good against anyone else. Thankfully, they did. Bishop is pretty aerodynamic. I think he can be a future main eventer. And then Toa Leona is just a beast. They do the coexist spots, and Swerve and Will actually make a good team. Like, they know where to do the spots. They know where to beat to enhance the drama. These guys just have it locked down. And Gates of Agony actually had a time of dominating the champion, Swerve, who eventually ended up breaking out on his own. But they should have been Will they were beating up, not Swerve. But yeah, the Gates of Agony look pretty good, cutting the ring in half, isolating Swerve from Will, the basic stuff. Most of the pops came from whatever Will and Swerve did, but Bishop Khan actually broke out some pretty sick shit, and Toa was protected by kicking out of an Oscutter. This did not have the usual structure, 
both faces shined individually and we even got the inner ring storytelling that we wanted aside from the can they coexist because at the finish we have swerve snapping bishop khan's arm off where credit has to be given he continues selling until he leaves but the story here is that swerve was willing to go the extra mile hurting bishop khan as a baby face while will osprey looks on in distress at what's about to happen to him we also have will trying to do the tiger driver with swerve willing him on like swerve wants this development for will but will just ain't doing it hidden blade to toa for the win will osprey and i love that toa gets pinned and not bishop because dude has taken enough pins okay so yeah as for the top spots of the match there are too many to name but the top 3 number 3 is the rope jump swerve stomp to the outside this was really impressive swerve just jumps off the middle rope it's a sort of lever motion to a swerve stomp to toe outside and it's one of the better delivered swerve stomps because he doesn't have to land on him on the floor it's him pushing toe down number 2 is the avalanche jackhammer by toe which should be a finisher super finisher even And then the number one spot is the finish, of course. Inner-ring storytelling, a foreshadowing of things to come, and this is probably how they'll end the feud down the line when Will finally wins the title, months from now or a year. So yeah, of course, this is pay-per-view undercard. This is a really good match. A negative spot though was when Toa did an outside dive and then completely missed Swerve and Will. They sold it, but Toa almost landed on his head. The post-match was just incredible. Will tries to do the shit he did last week. But then Swerve finally has had enough of it. Leg kick to Will, house call, stands tall at the closing go home dynamite. There's a way in at collision and I saw spoilers where Will gets the upper hand, so the math still checks in. Swerve is going to defend successfully. At Forbidden Door. So yeah, so this was a pretty good show. Second half was much better than the first, I think. And with this show, I think they managed to successfully build their top two programs. Of course, we have the women's title, the men's title. The build for the TNT title, I'm not kind of feeling. It's a bit missing. It's actually kind of like an afterthought. The IWGP title match... not very well built we only got to see naito tonight so yeah bad build never mind takagi against danielson at least we got takagi in two episodes I have a vignette in one i think it's pretty okay mercedes and stephanie i think had the best of what they could do sort of build we'll we'll see on collision what happens but at least she's going to have a match on an aw show at least Yeah, that's the minimum. If you don't have a match and win in an AEW show for Forbidden Door, that's a big negative. Orange versus Saber, I don't quite get where they're fighting, but Saber had a match against someone of the conglomeration, so this was okay. The Elite versus the Acclaimed, I think was well built actually. We had the Elite fuck over the Acclaimed for like weeks straight. Now we have Tanahashi against Okada again. Pretty good build. MJF versus Hechicero, not really. This might have been the worst built match of the show. And yeah, that's pretty much it. If we include Zero Hour, we have a party match. LIJ against Luchadors from CMLL and AAA, which is a miracle. We have Willow Nightingale versus Chris Statlander with Stardom Wrestlers, Tam Nakano and Momo Watanabe. Tam Nakano is incredible, by the way. Momo's okay. with that gimmick. And of course, Mariah May versus Soraya where I think Mariah is going to get her win back. She has to or else this would have been pointless. I want Soraya to win, but yeah, they're definitely going to go with Mariah. So yeah, that's it for this show and for this review. I hope you enjoyed. Been feeling a bit tired this week especially. So yeah, I might not have had the same fire that I did with my previous ones, but yeah, enjoy this one as well. Honest thoughts. Thank you for watching.